the question that I have been waiting to ask you for a very long time, and how how has it been last chat a few weeks? Is are there any laws to copywriting? You know, rules that have never changed, which you can apply and get results from. Well, Ash, when you when you sent me that question, I thought that's a really interesting uh, subject to ponder because you really have to step back because obviously if there are rules and laws and things you always have to do, I just tend to do them automatically. But I, I did step back and come up with a list of about five and some of them will be obvious and some of them may, may not be. But add them together and you, you shouldn't go too far wrong. Uh, the first one is, I'm afraid, grammar and spelling. You know, grammar and spelling have to be impeccable. Largely because people notice if they're not. Um, the example I always use is I, someone... I was on a call with who was telling me, oh, I've got a mate of mine who needs some marketing help. He's, he's opened a new place. No, no names, no pack drill. So while I was on the call, clicked up his website, and I said he needs a copywriter as well because the first line on the website was a question, who's it for? And he'd spelled who's wrong. I said, well, that, it's not just me. I mean, obviously, I'm, I, I, I shy away from the description grammar Nazi and prefer grammar Spartan. <laughs> but they are so important and, and what, what, what's come across to me over the last couple of years is it's not just me. People really, really notice. And lots of people notice when they can't do it themselves, but lots and lots of people notice when other people get it wrong. So it may be sort of um, copywriting 101, but make sure your grammar and spelling are absolutely impeccable. Um, the next thing I'd always say is keep it simple. I think people think when you're a writer, you've got to try to create vast vistas of imagery and and spectacular concepts but actually some most of what you're doing is getting a message across so keep it as simple as you possibly like i i saw someone yesterday said about about hemingway that um he was criticized once that he never used words that would make you have to check in a dictionary and actually if you're a copywriter you invert that you you never want someone to read something you've written and have to go and look up what you mean it should be really simple to get, because you're there to get the message across you are there to transfer information from one party to another and the, the, the simpler the easier and more accessible that is the better it's going to be and that that kind of ties into the next point which is always have your audience in mind and if you're copywriting on behalf of someone else you have to sort of put yourself in their shoes and know who it is they're trying to talk to and what it is they're trying to say to them that in, in turn will dictate the tone of voice but you're always kind of taking yourself to the other side of the room and listening to how the words are coming to you. And they should be coming to you as, like I say, as easily and accessibly and as informatively as they possibly can. Um, the other things I would suggest it's, and this is showing my journalistic roots here, but get the headline right and get the intro right and everything else will follow. Um, when I was training as a journalist, I think we were told about the pyramid, you know, all the, all the important stuff is at the top and then it kind of tapers as you go down. And if you get the, if you get the intro right, you know, because the rest of the copy just flows after it. And that's exactly the same if you're writing in a commercial context, because you're trying to hook the reader's attention. So that, that intro, you put so much effort into getting it right. And I know that there are SEO um, considerations when you're talking about websites which can, which can sometimes slightly compromise the absolute literary perfection of your headline and the intro but getting it right you, you, you've got people because people's attention spans are so short you need to get them quickly you need to tra attract their attention I think mm, these people know what they're talking about I'll keep reading um, and what was that I think there might have been something else yeah this, this is this is especially on commercial copywriting, and you see it quite a lot because you are, after all, you're there to deliver a message. You're there to convince people of the essential rightness and interest of the, uh, the, the products and services you're talking about. But sometimes you get to the end and there's no call to action, and there should always be something at the foot of a piece of commercial copy that says, and now I want you to do this. You've read all about us. We've told you all our great stories. Now, pick up the phone go to our contact form, get in touch, because that call to action, sometimes people just need to be given a delicate little nudge in the right direction 
so everything I, I try to everything I write every page I write for people's websites at the end it's and now do this um, I'm sure we could probably sit and talk for two hours about other rules and regulations but I'm hoping those that those are the kind of the basics you can start off with yeah no I think we should carry on talk about what's number six no <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, so to, to summarize, it's spelling and grammar number one. Number two is keep it simple. A, a great thing I was told is keep it simple, stupid. Is, yes. uh, yeah. Um, number three is to keep the audience in mind. Oh, number nice. four, the headline, the intro. And number five is that call to action, that nudge in the gentle direction we want someone to go. Yeah, like I say, there's, there's all kinds of things that you can talk about as being you know, desirable to create great mm -hmm. copy, but those things you won't go far wrong. I mean, going back to the the audience and the spelling and grammar, there's, there's one sort of rule I follow is if, if you're reading something and you're flying through a sentence and you stop and have to go back and read it again, then rewrite it. Because if your eye trips over it for whatever reason, then the reader's eye is going to trip over it and you've, you've lost the rhythm, you've lost that, that lovely sense that they're being carried along on a beautiful flowing piece of copy. So obviously always read everything back first. Um, and just to check, yes to check the spelling, yes to check the grammar, but also check that you've got a flow to it. I suppose that, that flow is going to be important because it's, it's, so, it's so natural. It's natural when it's flowing. You don't feel sold to which I think a lot of people struggle with, is that if they feel they're being pitched to, they'll just switch off. It, it depends on the context, because some people I write for are uh, shop sites. And obviously shop sites, if, if, if e-commerce is the, the raison d'etre of that site, then there's going to be a far more hard-edged sales element to the copy. So it's not always a bad thing, but, but yeah, in the example of a blog, for instance, Basically, generally, a blog isn't a, a direct sales tool. So, as you say, there the, the language and the, the need to keep people reading is um, is almost more important than getting than getting the, the hard edged sales message across as quickly as you can. Yeah, and and speaking of, of different kinds of copy, you know, from from copying a blog, copying on an e commerce page, um, what is the piece of copy that you're most proud of, and why are you proud of it? It's. It's a good question because without wishing to sound blasé or big headed, but I'm proud of all of it. And, and anytime someone, a customer is delighted with it for whatever reason, either because they enjoy the copy itself or because it is commercially effective for them. If I get an email back saying, this is great, this is just what I wanted, then, then you know, I get a real burst of euphoria from that. And I would say I'm, I'm proud of it. I mean, there are certain examples I can give you. There's a... A good network of mine, and um, I, I came up with a tagline for her for her website and for her pitches, and it's eight words. And she every time she stands up and delivers a pitch, she finishes off with that and turns and says, "That's Marty who gave me that. That's eight words." Um, there's a uh, there's a client I've got who makes garden buildings, and with along with an SEO colleague of mine, we've worked to completely rewrite his website over the last year or so. And we've done the product pages, we've done the packages and some of the more technical stuff. But the piece I was really interesting was his story. He sat down and told me the story of the company one day. And it made for a really nice read. And the lovely thing was, he said he had such great feedback from that. Not just in terms of people clicking on it, but people coming and saying, I read that. And that's a really nice read. I mean, for that, it's more content than style. He actually has a really interesting story to tell. But I was, I was very pleased with that. Um, I wrote a, an annual report for a homelessness charity in East London, which, which went down really well with, with the people who run the charity, with their, with their backers and their sponsors. And I know that was, that was seen as a real force for good with them, which I was delighted about. There's a design firm in central London who were coming up for their centenary and wanted the story written in book form of their first hundred years. So sat down with them, did a bit of research on the company, got together a meeting of lots of the former partners and members of staff and came up with about 10,000 words. I was, I was really happy with and importantly, so were they. Um, I wrote a, a speech for a breakfast keynote, someone at one of the, the, uh, the clients I work for, and she was delivering a 20 minute breakfast speech. And I know it went down well, because the next time I saw her, she told me she'd used the speech again at a different event. So 
like I say, I, I'm proud of all of it, whether it's eight words or 10,000 words. If people are happy with it and I know I've done a good job, then, then yeah, that will count. Fab. And is, is that why you do it? Is that why? Is it because you want to make people happy and, and have that big impact on their lives? It's definitely a part of it. I mean, it's, it's definitely, I, you ask any person who's in business and there'll be a mixture of, I do it because I'm good at it, because it feeds my family, it keeps the wolf from the door. But there are definitely days when you, you get a sense of euphoria that's not just to do with money. It's to do with the fact that you've done a job and people have been delighted, not just happy, but really delighted with what you've done. And that's, that's a really nice sensation to get. And I'm sure you, you'll get that for any business. Whatever it is you do, there's the kind of nuts and bolts reasons why you do it, but there's a sort of deeper level of personal satisfaction that comes from knowing that you, you've done something that you like, that you're good at, and you've done a really good job. Yeah, 100% agree with that. I think that uh, having that deep satisfaction not only ensures that your standards are high, but everyone else is a high too. And you can always tell when someone loves what they do because it will show in their work. And if their work is up for scratch, you can probably guarantee that they love it. And you can tell in your work that you love what you do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you must go back, rewrite and draft and draft until you are 100% happy with what you've got because you love it so much. Yeah. And you want that, that impact. I mean, you do. You want, it's like I said about always reading your, your copy through and, and always there's the overnight rule I was talking about someone with someone recently and so it's because sometimes you know you work until late in the night you finish about half past 11 put it down go to bed have a sleep come back and before you send the copy in the morning have another really good read through it because I guarantee there's always little things you'll spot little sort of sounds and the use of words and think well I can improve that and then you send it through as you said there's there's no one should be so arrogant as to think they're going to get it right first time, and I'm certainly not. I'd like to think you get it fairly close, but it's always going to be worth that second, third read. And if there's a particular section that you've, you've, you've wrestled with, then that could be three or four times you'll read it, you'll try it different ways, structure the sentences differently until you're happy with what you've got. In terms of that restructuring of sentences and going back and doing the words, and, and you know, why, why do you think that communication is so important you know it's it's everything it's what we're doing now we're, we're, we're communicating we? who is that? <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 how we as a species get along together and how we impart information to each other we we tell stories we say how are you and it and it's more than just yes fine get on with it it's in all relationships whether that's personal political commercial it's all about imparting information to each other and being able to receive that information. And th this goes back to the point we were talking about at the top, to make that communication as good as possible. If you've got a knack of being a great communicator, you know, we can sit here all day and talk about great lines from speeches that have absolutely landed with audiences and that still resonate 50 years on. I'm thinking, you know, I have a dream. So, you know, a piece of writing like that, a piece of oratory like that, and it all comes down to communication. And sometimes, yes, it's facts. Sometimes it's ideas. Sometimes it's, it's sentiments. But it's all, it, it all comes down to communication. I think a great example of how, of how powerful it is is going all the way back to our inception, you know, where there was Neanderthals. And Neanderthals were bigger than us. They were stronger than us. But they didn't have the part of their brain that was the first communication was much smaller than what ours was. So we were, we were actually were able to kill them off thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years ago because we're able to work as a group, because we're able to communicate. So we are here because of communication. You know, we would not have evolutionary survived without it. So it's... Ash, that's brilliant. And that's a line I'm going to use in future. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> because what comes across in that story is the collective effort it's how people get on with each other because you know obviously we're all individuals and you know we've seen the last few weeks with COVID-19 that you know being in your own company isn't always the easiest thing we need people around us and part of needing people and being able to get on with people and get the most meaning out of our lives is being able to communicate with them. so so yeah, communication is, is kind of everything. And, and I guess we kind of take it for granted until you, you sit and analyze it in a conversation like this, just how 
importance is it's going back to as you say that the, the, the dawn of time for us yeah yeah and it's 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 crazy and in your your in your conversation just you mentioned about the difference between oratory copy and written copy is there is there a difference between the two you know is the do some things have bigger impact once they're said rather than if yeah. they're written or is it similar yeah there are definitely sort of little tweaks tweaks and and tricks you can use when you are when someone's speaking than if you're answering a question like that you know with a piece of writing there's definitely ways you can you can say things better you can um it's like the the, the rule of three you'll say this is the most wonderful fantastic and amazing mm. experience i've ever had which you which might not look that in, impactful on a piece of paper but if you use it in speeches you, you listen out for it with political leaders all the time it's that that sort of growing crescendo of one two three and three is where you land the point um so and that's that's a slightly different skill because you, you can use it in writing as well and, and good writing and good communication is good whether it's written or spoken but there are certain ways in which you can alter the structure of sentences the structure of what you're saying um to have a different impact when you're speaking rhetorically i like that i, I didn't know that there's that if you use in the one two three and that you can yeah. get a bigger impact is, is there something else like that? anything else that would be really interesting to know when talking oratorily that's a word um, to do with the actual language itself mm. it, it, again it's to do with sound and, and i guess to do with rhymes and to do with just things like alliteration and assonance which which i okay, can't work on the page but they're much more powerful and, and now of course while i'm saying this i'm, I'm desperately trying to think of, of something that, that, that demonstrates that but I, I, I did a talk last year and i was talking about change in life and it said it's change isn't a threat change is an opportunity it's to be welcomed and relished and embraced and of course the other thing you've got if you're speaking if, if, out loud you can you know, use body language to to emphasise it, it. It all works in together. The language and what you're saying, how you're saying it, and how you're using your body while while you're while you're talking. Um, there's all kinds of little tricks which far more experienced professional speakers than me will undoubtedly be able to share with you. I'll have to ask. I'll have to get one on yeah. and ask them <laughs> and see what they can say to me. Um, I think it's it's so incredibly important to not only communicate well but to communicate in such a way where you're going to get your ideas across to people because i struggle with this all the time where i have all these amazing ideas in my head but to get them out to people is so so tough and there is not a day goes by when i don't somehow miscommunicate and is there is there a way which or to put advice where you could give someone to show them that they I'm seeing miscommunication right now. But is there a way in which they can be aware of this of these miscommunications and to and to lower them and limit them? Or... Yeah, get a good get a good ghostwriter. Give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Wink. Is that... But seriously, you know, sometimes it can it can be hard. It can be hard. You've got all these ideas, you've got these things you want to say, and it comes out in, in a torrent or a brain dump. A uh, client I was working for this week has loads of things he wants to say to his particular audience. And he just sends me, it's almost like a stream of consciousness. And I'll put it in order. I mean, apart from, apart from anything else, the, 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 the situation you're talking about, practice. Just if you, if you know you're going to have to speak to people, I mean, you think that uh, political leaders before party conference just stand up there and read it off the auto queue. Practice, practice the, the, the rhythm, practice how you're going to use the room and talk to different corners. It's, it's all part of, as we go back to the basics, getting a message across, getting your ideas across, and getting people on your side. Because, I mean, apart from anything else, just being confident in your words when you're standing and addressing a group of people. If you're just stood there reading an auto cue, or if you start like, I mean, Theresa May, Tory party conference a couple of years back when she had the cough. Well, that wasn't, that was nerves. And it was also because she hadn't warmed up her voice properly. She hadn't done the, the vocal exercises, which are always a, a good idea. And of course, no one remembers what she said that day because all anyone remembers is the, the coughing. Mm. Which, it's, so in communication terms, that was an absolute disaster. And the one before that, someone gave her a P45, which was... <laughs> <even> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, he gets remembered for that, not her. <laughs> oh, and in terms of importance, then, what what piece of copy, or how does your copy, how has your copy changed someone's life? Um, as it increased their sales, increased their revenue, what was probably the biggest impact your copies have on someone? Um, the best example of that is I've already referenced him as the guy who met, who creates um, garden rooms based down in Sussex. Absolutely brilliant guy to deal with. Great client. Love working with them. And I'm writing the copy. One of my pals is doing the SEO for him. So bet- and between us, we, we make a, a formidable team. And just recently, I was speaking to the client and he said, there was one month recently where the number of online inquiries he'd noticed was um, 400% up on the same month the previous year. Wow. And, you know, we could sit and talk all day. I mean, both John, the SEO guy, and I, we're both nice guys. So I'll say, oh, it's all down to your SEO. And he'll say, oh, it's all down to your copy. Client doesn't care. He's, he's literally down at the car showroom buying his latest fast car because his phone is ringing off the hook. And that, that always stands to me. And it's, I, I revamped my rep website last year because I wanted to emphasize that this is copywriting that gets results. It's lovely if people say, I really like your words. I love working with you. I, I think your blogs read superbly. But ultimately, I want to emphasize that this actually does make a difference, that this will make a difference to the commercial performance of your business. And that, that is the best example I've come across so far, because let's face it, 400% is an absolutely spectacular figure in any context. And that's not one piece of copy. That's the whole suite of products and that we, we've talked about. And I mentioned about the Our Story page and the different packages they do and some of the expert stuff we've written on there. But it definitely has changed between us working as a team that business hundred percent is crazy well, <laughs> yeah I, i'd love to 400 percent increase my um well, yeah wouldn't we all <laughs> no one's gonna gonna turn that down but it was it was great to hear because it can be quite hard to prove the, the sort of empirical link between copy and your bottom line you know if so if someone comes along and says why should, if I spend 500 pounds with you and you do a piece of copy, will I make 1,000 pounds on the back of it? And it's not always easy to prove that. It's, it's always very difficult to prove that. You can say, look, it's about the sort of an- subliminal ancillary benefits that people will you know, see you more because you'll be more visible. People will respond to you more because you're expressing yourself so articulately. But actually drawing a direct line between this piece of copy and your bank balance is not always easy to prove. Mm. So when you get a moment like that, then, yeah, you, uh, you, you tell everyone you can. Yeah, I can understand that. Same for coaching. It's very difficult to go, you know, if you, if you spend, you know, um, two grand with me, you're going to get £10,000 back. But I can't tell you how. And I can't tell you, you know, and you have to, and you have to do do the things that we tell you to do. It's like how how can you how can you say there's, there's a connection to that, especially when you're you're waiting for them to do it. it it's why I think testimonials and case studies are just so so important, so oh, that you can. Agreed. So you agreed. Can, you cannot beat a good testimonial because if people will, will look at your website and they'll look at your materials and they want they they, they want to be reassured they're asking the question what's in it for me and if you can find someone who's either from you know the same district or has got the same problem or the same issue and they read a testimonial from that person who says this company solved that issue and you you as the reader immediately identify and think well if they did it for them they can do it for me it's it's a really really powerful tool again it's not it's it's not an exact science it's not like i, I come along with a widget and i plug it into your business and flick a switch and suddenly things go twice as fast and twice as long. It, it's not as simple as that, but it is definitely a tool for good. It's definitely something that's going to benefit your business and ultimately your business performance. I suppose you must spend a hell of a lot of time working with the client to look at the audience that they have. So yeah. they can get that. That's probably, in my view, probably the most important part. Am, am I wrong or am I right? Am I close? You're absolutely right, Ash. It's the first question. If, if I sit down with someone, I always say, look, give me an hour and we'll download everything that I need to know. But the first question is, who's this for? Who do you want to talk to? 
And quite often people, especially in a B2C context, will say, well, it's, it's anyone really. And that's when you go back with a follow-up question and say, no, I, I, need, I need to know, is it people in a particular area, is it a particular age, sex, whatever? Because that is going to dictate how you write the copy. You, you've got that person in mind, as we were saying earlier about the importance of the audience. You've got them in your mind when you're putting the words together. So that person that you've identified as your target customer is most likely to respond. The copy is going to resonate with them. Mm. And so, yeah, it's, it's a good question because that is the first question I ask. And the last question I ask is always, why you? And I, I remember I was, I, was, <laughs> I was having this initial meeting with someone who worked uh, for a hospital charity. And I got to the end and said, look, I'm walking down the street with 10 pounds. I'm in a charitable mood. There's thousands of charities I could give to you. Why would I give to you? And her answer was, because we help a million people a year. And I thought, yeah, good answer. <laughs> and usually by that point in the conversation, people are warmed up enough that, that to, to give an answer that always reflects something that's, that's unique to their business. It could be the fact they're a family firm. It could be the fact they give outstanding customer service it could be something they take for granted and haven't even thought of but actually differentiates them from all the other people in their field and that's why that's that's part of, of my job is to tease that out of them uh, over the course of like i say if i if i get an hour with someone i can probably get to the heart of what it is they want to say and what benefits that they bring to people with what they do great great saying perception is reality and you know, if you go to a who said comp- that? Oh, who said that? Oh, you, me, just. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, Ashley Smith, twenty twenty. <laughs> it's never been said before. Um, but yeah, it's it's like when you go to um, a networking group and say that you're after, you know, high energy professional people. You will go, probably not in a suit, but you'll go dressed smartly with a shirt with a tie, because that's how they. That's their world. So you enter their world in a way that they understand. You wouldn't, if you're after extreme professional people, you aren't going to go with a, a t-shirt and some joggers. It's just, mm. so why would you write copy, which is at a different audience than what you want that you want? So it totally and makes that, the, the concepts of perception is reality. Uh, that, that, that translates into other ways of the way you market your business as well. Um, very famous motivational speaker. I'm not going to name him because he's famous enough already. I saw him talk a couple of years ago. He was brilliant. And he said, I am the best motivational speaker in the UK. And everyone went, he said, do you know how I know that? Because it's what it says on my website. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. And that's, as, as you can see, that's two, maybe three years ago. And I just thought exactly that. If you, I suppose the other way is to sort of say fake it till you make it. Act as if you have faith and faith will be given to you. But if that's how you position yourself and you've got the, uh, in his case, the stones to carry it off, then as you say, that perception will become a reality. Yeah, spot on. And it, running a business takes so much confidence. So much confidence. Yes. So Which to... doesn't always come naturally. It doesn't. I mean, we, we, we may touch on this later, but I have so much respect for anybody who starts, runs and builds their own business from the ground. Because, like I say, the good days are great. The good days are euphoric. The, the days when the phone doesn't stop ringing and everyone tells you you're wonderful and you, you're literally walking around six feet off the ground. You can't feel, it, feel the ground beneath your feet. And at the same time, the bad days when the phone doesn't ring or someone says, I'm, I don't want your services or someone says, I, I've used your services and you're terrible. Those days you, you are just subterraneanly bad and, and, and maintaining the, the self-belief and the sheer guts to say, no, I'm doing the right thing and I'm, and I'm good at this and I'm going to get to where I want to go is not always easy. It does take a little bit of you know, summoning up the gumption and a bit of willpower because it, it's it's not always easy and i have a great admiration like i say for anyone who runs a business but people who say oh yes i, I started my business the three weeks later i was you know working 10 days a week and earning a million pounds a month fantastic good for you but that's not the most common experience because you have to build it up and it can take time and you you know you'll have those long dark nights of the soul when you'll stare at the ceiling thinking why am i doing this can i do this 
And sometimes the only voice that's going to answer back is from inside your soul saying, yes, you can. Yeah. I had a, a great conversation yesterday with a guy called Kim, Kim Wheatley. Um, and I was talking to him about how when we both first started our businesses, his was about 20 years ago. And mine was obviously quite recent, uh, about last year. Um, we both had this idea that we'd open up and the world would come to us and that we would just be rolling it. And obviously, I think it happens to a lot of people. The reality dawns on you and you go, ah, the world doesn't know we exist. So they can't get on. And which is where marketing comes in. Which is where marketing comes in. <laughs> Sometimes I think marketing's a dirty word, but it's all about um, one of my business pals, a guy I network with, he... He says the same thing. You can have the greatest website in the world. If you don't tell people about it, you're like a, a billboard in the desert. You know, you're still doing a great job, but it's not enough to do a great job. You have to tell people you're doing a great job. And the way you tell people and how well you tell the story is what dictates how successful you're going to be. It's, it's not enough to be good at what you do. Yeah. You've got to get that, that message out there. Yeah. Especially people's stories as well, because everyone has an excellent story. And, I've found, especially with what I do in terms, you know, the coaching and the, and the intimate, empathetic sort of way that thing you need to do things, you need a story that people can resonate with. And I mean, I, I'm very good at telling my story verbally, but I'm awful at telling it on paper. I think people sometimes just need your help. Uh, what it is in a situation like that, and, I, and I'll hold my hands up before I go any further and say, I suffer from this too, is you're so close to the business. What, what you're doing, you are right up there and it's where you are. You're at that cold face every day. And sometimes it's very hard to express that in words. And someone who comes in and stands right back from you, someone in, in my shoes, says, okay, you tell me this. Right, I can see that. You can see the big picture. and You can put it into words. Um, I remember speaking a couple of years ago, not long after I started copywriting, to a woman who wants to write a 200-page pamphlet on what she did. And she said, I've sat here for a day with a blank sheet in front of me and we had a coffee for half an hour and I did it but in fairness I should say that the, the hardest thing I've found to write in the last three years is my own website because again because it's because it's mine and because I'm so close to it it's not just the emotional investment it's the fact you can't get that perspective which you can when it's someone else you, you can easily bowl in and sort someone else's problems when you're stood there in that close and it, I, it was the hardest thing to write when I, I re-optimized my site last year and someone the, the guy who I did it with said okay just give me a bit more copy on that a few things on these areas etc and, I, and I, I sweated and slaved over it and it's because whoever you are whatever your business is you are so close to it you know you and I would sit down and you could tell me the story and I'd be able to turn it around easily you know verbally in writing whatever but when you're trying to do it yourself and actually go from just telling the story as you would in a nice relaxed manner face to face down the pub whatever to actually writing it down on paper it's much harder yeah. i was going to ask you actually about your website i was going to ask about what was it like to do it but you've, you've preempted my question and you've told me <laughs> yeah, I, yeah well i think yes i think i have because it, it was it was hard and I, like i say this this good pal of mine who's an seo expert he helped me a lot with with the optimization elements um and obviously a website is critical and you, you've got to have it and it should be written as well as possible but i will hold my hands up and say i don't spend as much time on my on my website as i should i don't put as much content on there as i should it's, it's like the old thing about cobbler's shoes you know the, the thing you do for yourself you do for everyone else you kind of neglect for yourself so yeah. hands up on that one you see it all the time with chefs chefs they'll make this beautiful beautiful food in the kitchen we'll come home have a microwave meal and that's it <laughs> that's a great way of putting it I'm, I'm taking that one as well thank you very much <laughs> i i everything's been taken from me today this is this, <laughs> it's okay it's fine it's fine i'm learning a lot too so it's okay <laughs> glad to hear it but yeah i mean in, i suppose what's good for you is that once you have so much copy out there and you have loads of copy out there that you can just point to different websites and go, I did that, I did that, I did that. You know, my website is, is just my website. It's, it's mine and, and I've done it, but this is what I've done for others. And, this is, and that's what's most important. It's the others. Yeah, it's, for instance, I don't have a portfolio. Um, people will say, you know, send me the best things of what you've done. And as discussed earlier, there are particular pieces of copy I'm proud of. 
but I've now done enough work for people in various niches and industries to be able to say, okay, tell me what you're doing and I'll find you something that's directly relevant or analogous to what it is you do. And I'll show that. So rather than just, just having a portfolio of all kinds of stuff, I can be fairly specific because of the breadth of um, experience I've got in all kinds of fields. And in those fields, um, who, who do you want to work with next um, in terms of industry or? Well, so I'm rubbish on this question because I really can work with anybody and I can work with SMEs and I can work with brands and I can work with agencies. And I like working with agencies, web design agencies or marketing agencies who require a regular supply of quality content. And I'm not naive. Most times people have got someone on board or a regular relationship already. So it can be a bit of a slow burner. But if I get in with an agency and start producing regular copy for them, then we can really build something. So that's good. Uh, if we're playing spot the unicorn and going for the absolute dream client, um, my most recent long-term contract was with a national sports governing body. I was working on their comms team on project and BAU materials and absolutely loved it. So something similar to that would be, I think, given my, my love of sport, my background in sports content would be just perfect. But like I say, we may be playing Hunt the Unicorn there. What, um, what is your background? What is your, because I know we've mentioned it a couple of times now, but what is your background? The ba my background is in journalism um, and specifically sports journalism. I spent more than 20 years on the sports desks of uh, various national newspapers. Um, so that's where the, the love of words comes from. Well, actually, the, the love of words predates that. I, I realised in my mid-teens that I, I really love sport, particularly football, and I liked being very good with words. So I put the two together and thought I'd become a sports journalist. And luckily, with a break or two along the way, managed to get there and did it for, like I say, more than, more than two decades. Genuinely lived the dream. Wow. I've got a good friend of mine. Um, he used to love playing video games. And he thought, I love writing. I love playing video games. Games journalist. And he, we, we did, a, <laughs> my university did a course about games journalism. I was like, what? This is crazy. And now, now he's getting paid to play video games. I'm like, what? How have you, how have you managed to, to wing this? And, you know, you, you must have been paid to, go to sporting events to, to watch or I did I liked writing I tended to be on the production side so I was you know in the office subbing or revising other people's words but I did like writing as well like doing the whole thing and yes there were certain moments you think I'm getting paid to do this and <laughs> it's I, I would never say it felt like a hobby because you know we took it too seriously and it's it's a fairly stressful um, demanding profession but at the same time, you're working on sport. So there's always a, a little bit of uh, the back of your mind thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. When I got my first job on the Daily Express in 1990, one of my cousins said to me at a Christmas party, he said, you do know how lucky you are. And I said, in my defense, yes, I do know how lucky. <laughs> but you know, I, I don't see it as luck. I don't think it's luck. I think it's, it's, a, it's a skill, talent, and hard work. And it, that's, Especially, especially the hard work, and you do need you need an occasional break. And but the, the thing about breaks is you've got to be able to capitalise. Because there's no point getting a break if you're no good and don't make the most of it. Yeah, you do need those sort of the universe giving you a uh, a bit of a nudge to sort of go. Here's here's the thing you've been working towards. Make hay while the while the sun is shining. You know. Mm. Yeah, I, I've got. I've got to be honest. I don't believe in karma and balance in the universe and that sort of thing. I, I, I really do think you, you know, you make your own luck. But at the same time, yes, I will agree that there is a certain amount of serendipity about how opportunities present themselves. I, to give an example, I came out of um, college with my NCTJ qualification, and we had to do a couple of weeks' work experience. And I had previously done work experience at my local paper in West London. So I knocked on the door, said, can I have another fortnight? They said, yeah, happy to have you. Went great. Last day, I went in to speak to the editor and I said, I've had a wonderful time. 
anytime you need a junior reporter, please do let me know. And he said, we've loved having you. Thank you very much. Yes, keep in touch. We'll keep your name. He said, but none of my reporters has left in six months. Okay, fair dues. He called me back into his office two hours later and said, you're not going to believe this, but one of my reporters has just quit. Can you start on Monday? <laughs> and that was the start of 24 years unbroken working as a journalist. From you know, It wasn't all down to that moment, but, but again, we go back to you've got to be there in the right place. And we can, I can tell you the story about how I got to be there you know, doing work experience for them. But once that door opens, you've got to pile through it with you know both feet and make the absolute best of it yeah it's it's nuts it's absolutely nuts. and it happens time and time again and i understand that you don't believe in the, in, in the universe or that sort of stuff but i i believe in the subconscious mind and i mm -hmm. believe that yeah i have those moments when you go oh what's his name what's his name what's his name and then you forget you forget about it and then three days later you go it was tim it was tim scott that's what is his name you know, the subconscious mind is always working, even if you're not aware of it. I agree with that. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. You know, you, you have this goal of you know, sports journalism, and you had it in your head, and you had it in your head, and you had it in your head, and, and over time, without even realising it, probably intuitively, you put yourself in positions where it was going to happen. And yeah. Yeah, and even, even when... I don't know if you've ever done psychometric testing where they, they test your responses to various questions. And yeah. They get your values and also who you are and, and you come up with a mixture of red, blue, green, and yellow. And my, every time I do it, I think I'm not going to be trammeled by this. I'm me. I'm an individual. And it comes up with the same result, which is blue and blue, which is like, I'm an analyst. I analyze things. And the, the, the um, conclusion is always that your perfect job, Mr. Booth, would be a librarian. And I go, okay, so how is it that I actively pursued and sought out a career in sports desks, the most rambunctious, loud, high pressure, noisy, fun situation? And couldn't it be a greater contrast with a library? Now, I know that there is a good answer to that, but it's, it always it always amuses me because it goes back to what you're saying. You put yourself in positions consciously and subconsciously where you know you're going to have the opportunity to do the thing it is you most want to do. Even in my case, if it's against my, my sort of inbuilt nature, which is to be quiet, methodical, analytical. What's it like now when you're not in the sports test where you are a bit quiet, methodical, analytical? <laughs> Well, I guess it feels more natural, really. <laughs> but yeah, I, obviously I work, most of the time I work from home. I work on my own. So yeah, there must be some, on some very primeval level, it's, it's really flicking the switch for my, my analytical um, nature. But I, yeah, I, I don't mind it. I, don't, I, I, like the, I like the problem solving element of someone, like I say, if someone just gives me a, a brain dump of a thousand words and says, can you turn that into an 800 word article? I, I like crossword puzzles, the same sort of thing. It's just, yes, it, there's the word element to it, but there's working your way methodically to, to something that you send back to a client and they say, yeah, bang on, that's what I wanted to say. Amazing. And who would be your dream client, you know, living or dead, who would be your dream client to work with and to write for? <laughs> We're back to spot the unicorn, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I might know them. I might know it if, if they're alive. I might know them. <laughs> you know um, it's a tough one. I'd, I'd, I'd love to work for a really, really big brand who's got tons and tons of great stories to tell and a quality product. So if, if, given my sporting background, it would be a really big client in sport who had lots and lots of great stories to tell, lots of interesting people on their books whose stories they once had told. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't put a name on it because if I say one name and you know, if, if I say Nike, Adidas say, well, he didn't say Adidas. Um, but, but, but someone, someone like that, I, I want you know, a really good, big, meaty project I can get, get stuck into that needs loads and loads of great words where I can genuinely make a difference into how they're getting their message across in a way that's, that brings them um, satisfaction with that message, but also brings them commercial advantage because it really works, because this, this stuff does actually work. Yeah. Any footballers in particular that you know? <laughs> I, know I, was gonna say, I know you mentioned about football, and uh, I'm just curious. Um, given I'll, I'll show you my colours, I'm a Chelsea fan, and I'm not sure that Frank Lampard has written his autobiography yet, 
And I, I've met Frank a couple of times, and he is genuinely as lovely a bloke in the flesh as, as he always comes across on telly. So I really should drop him a line and say, Frank, who's doing your autobiography for you? You should do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get on, I'll get on the line to um to Frank's manager and uh, and we'll get that call sorted don't you <laughs> you know really <laughs> no, I, just, I, I, I genuinely don't however I do know um an ex footballer called Mel Eves who used to play for oh, yeah. Um, yes, you do. yeah I, I know Mel um so might be able to get you in there and see if he knows see if he knows someone close to Frank so Ah, well, because I'm afraid that, that I, I think Mel might have been before his time, but Steve Bull was my favourite Wolves player. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, was, I was lucky enough to meet and interview Bully once back in the day, and he would make a great story, but I think he's done it. I think he, he did the book recently, so his story is already out there. But someone out there has got, the, people have got stories to tell, and what you find is that everybody's got a story to tell. Everyone's got a story in them. And just in the same way, we used to say, any time you go to a football match, a rugby match, a cricket match, there is always a story comes out of it. Um, everyone's got a story. Yeah, interesting. I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree. I've had so many conversations with people go, what do I say? You know, how do I sell myself? I've got no skills. I've got, like, you've got your story. You've got your life. You know, yeah. you, you've got something which is truly unique to you. And you just have to tell that in a way which is going to resonate with your target group. And that's and, it. And sometimes people don't know it. Sometimes it, it takes someone, it takes them to bounce the story off someone for the sort of say, You do realise that's quite unusual. Um, I had it recently with, with a, a very old friend of mine who's come back on board as a client recently. And we were just having a, a conversation. He wanted a bit more sort of prominence and visibility and dynamism about the communications around the business. And he kind of said almost as a, as a throwaway phrase, he said, because, of course, we've never lost a customer. And I, I went back and said, well, what do you mean you've never lost a customer? He said, well, in all these years, we've got a 100% retention rate with customers. No one's ever sort of come back and said, no, I'm cancelling my contract. I'm going somewhere else. And I said, do, 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 do you realise that's, that's a really good thing? He said, oh, I guess so. And it, it almost needed someone else, like we were saying earlier, someone from outside the business to say, wow, that's amazing. To get them to think, yeah, that's a, that's actually a, a good story, a good story to tell, and, and it makes me different to because most of us have lost customers. It, it happens; it's a part of business, but not for him. And he he just he was so you know unaware of what a great thing it was. And of course, now it's it's all over his marketing materials, or it should be by now, anyway. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes you know we both we we fired customers, you know, <laughs> because they were they were awful. So to never lose one is just incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, we spoke earlier, you know, about the footballers, about, about books and about um, them writing their books and telling their stories. Have you ever wrote a book? Would you want to write a book? Um, yes and yes. I actually really enjoyed it. I mean, the book, the book that I wrote, I'll tell you a bit more about it. It's a firm called um, Louis de Soissons. And various, some people might know Louis de Soissons was the guy who, um, was behind the design of Welling Garden City, which was one of the first garden cities, which was a movement just after the First World War, so 100 years ago. And Louis de Soissons, the company, is still going 100 years on, still bears his name, still got a fantastic portfolio and reputation for delivering really good planning and, uh, and design. And they asked me to come in and write the story. So I went and read up all about Louis and, and the company the whole concept of garden cities and where, how the company has grown and developed and mutated and changed and some of the big projects they've been involved in over the last hundred years. And I absolutely loved it. I, I loved the, you know, the, the, the task of pulling together all the information of collating it into the various chapters and then writing the chapters with a, with a strong, consistent voice that really told the story. And I was very pleased with it. That's 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 the. That, I mean, it's it's a mini book. Really, I've I've loved the chance to do something a bit longer. I've written a couple of books, not for publication, just for sort of personal satisfaction, of thirty, forty thousand words. But um, but no, that's that's the one thing that's actually got published that I was really really pleased with, and would love to do more. Absolutely love to. Wow. Tell me more about that book. Tell me more about the. You know what it was like the journey. How you went, what you went through. Yeah, well, it was. I, I got it through through a networking contact, and uh, this guy just said, "Look, we we think we want to do a book to to 
commemorate the centenary, which was in 2019. And like I said, I enjoyed all the parts of the process. First of all, the planning of it and deciding, you know, how we would pull together all the content. But then actually going out and I, I went up to, I had a night out in Welling Garden City, which by the way, is a beautiful place to look at. And, and if you go in there with the eye of, you know, writing a book about the guy who laid this place out, you do think, wow, this is a bit different. It's, it's, it's definitely, if, if anyone knows Welling, they'll know what I mean. Um, so to go there and listen to one of the, someone talk to the historical society all about Louis, the man himself, and then to go into the sort of company archives and, and meet loads of the old partners from the business, some of whom had worked with guys who worked with the founder back, you know, way back when. And just to get a, a, an impression of, of what the company did, but also the people, the people who worked there and, and the, the work that they had done. Uh, and like I say, the, the, the process of, of pulling it together over the course of, um, of several days, I really enjoyed that. Almost as much as, because obviously I enjoy the writing of it and pulling it into the, the finished version, which, you know, the company were very happy with. I've still yet to see a copy and I'd, I'd love to get my hands on it um, because I was really pleased with the work. But I, I was pleased with the way the work went, the way, the way it was all organised and um, just, just, just the content. It, it was a good story. They were good. The, you know, the guys who run the company are a good bunch of blokes and it's a good, good group of people and they had a great story to tell and i helped them to tell it and i was very pleased with that Fab. and that was in 2019 you said last year well, i think i wrote it in 2018 in time for the centenary and I, like i say, I, I really should drop them a line and say can i have a copy you should do you absolutely should yes. do should give you one yeah. mm. I'm, I'm maybe not as good with my crm as i should be i spend all my time talking to people like you ash <laughs> I'll do it for you then. You give me some names and I'll do it for you. I'll get, it, I'll get that on, get that sorted. Um, especially now with coronavirus, I bet they're not doing anything. I bet, I bet they're just waiting for you, Martin. Just waiting for you to, to message them and say, where's my book? Coronavirus is interesting because it has been a challenge. It's been a challenge to businesses to, to show a little bit of, we were talking about gumption and you know, self-belief, but also a willingness to, to adapt and to be flexible and to be a bit versatile in the way the way they operate but also what they're offering um coronavirus has been has been a, a tremendous challenge to to every business in this country big or small and some obviously have thrived if you're in healthcare or if you're in a supermarket you've had a great time for the last couple of months more far more usual is the experience of people who've seen business disappear who've seen clients walk away and it's it's been a tough time and it's it's a time that we're, we're going to be paying the price for it for a, a long time and it's, it's definitely going to be a challenge to all of us to everyone who owns a business but part of that challenge is to be resilient and to be ready and to be flexible and versatile to go in whatever direction you need to go into because one of my favorite sayings is this too shall pass you know the, this this shall pass and we will come out the other side and how we are now might depend, might dictate how we are when we do come out the other side. I have that saying um, over my desk, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. um, not only is it an extremely life affirming thing when things are going bad, but it's also a very humbling thing when things are going very, very well because everything passes and you've got to be prepared for things. If they're going well to go badly, if they're going badly to go well again. And it can be, I look at it every single day and think about, you know, where am I? Where am I? You know, is it, is it good? Is it bad? And am I, how am I going to maintain this or am I going to get through this? It's different. And you're right. We've all, we've all lost clients. We've all been hit. I know I, I was. And I think that because people got used to it, they found new ways, new ways of doing things to meet this new challenge. Mm -hmm. And those which are doing the best are those which can, most creatively address that challenge and the coming recession is going to be long and deep and you're going to have to have more creativity to get through that than what it is now there's a great phrase around football which is now seen as a horrible old cliche which is when people say we're going to take each game as it comes um, the only reason that's a cliche is because it's so true and that is definitely linked to this two shall pass 
you, you, you control what you can control. You don't worry so much about, you know, yesterday or tomorrow because that's gone and it's not here yet. But, you know, this too shall pass. Today, I'll do what I need to do. And it's almost like you start at square one every day and almost have to reaffirm what it is you do, how it is you do it, and how you can best do it in the circumstances, which at the moment, as you say, are extremely challenging and come out better, stronger on the other side. Yeah, it's it's incredibly tough. And I feel for those services like tourism, like the restaurants, which have just massively suffered. I don't know how they're going to recover. I don't think that that sector is ever going to be the same again, especially tourism. I think tourism is uh, massively changed. And yeah. Yes, it is. It's going to be very different. I mean, we, we went on a lovely holiday to uh, a Greek island last year. That's not possible this year. And it may not be possible in the same form for many years to come. I mean, we're, we're talking things beyond our control and knowledge, like vaccines and restrictions, whatever. Things could change. But right now, the prospect is, as you say, if, and I've got friends who work in the travel industry, and they've said, yeah, it, it is, it's unbelievably challenging. It's like a, a pal of mine who's a window cleaner. And the day after lockdown was announced, all his business vanished on the spot. So, because he can't go into people's premises. And that's going to be replicated across industries, across sectors. There's going to be a lot of people like that. But he's gone away and tried, found something else to do and, and found another niche. And now, as lockdown eases, he's got that to do, and people are going to be letting him in to, to clean their windows again. So, it's, it's just it's a tough time. It is, there is, there's no getting away from it, and there's no... You, you know, you find yourself falling back on cliches. It is a tough time. It's a tough time for all of us. I am more and more thinking about the future. More and more thinking about, you know, it's hard now, but I reckon it's going to get a lot harder. And the recession we're going to have is going to be long and deep. I think I mentioned it earlier. Yeah. And I, I worry a lot about those which are struggling now. How the hell are they going to manage when it happens? And, and you know, I know that you've, you've been in business a little while. And, you know, you've, you've got a, a, a reasonable amount of experience in terms of you know, your journalism and, and you've seen a lot. Well, is, is there some kind of advice you'd give to someone in that recession period? What to do? In the recession period or just generally what, you know, about starting a business? I'd say right now in the recession period, <coughs> because it's going to be coming. And for business owners, especially uh, business owners which haven't got as much experience as you. Um, yeah. What to, um, to I, I guess I, I wrote something on my website a, a few months ago about things I wish I'd known when I started the business. Because because to explain, I, I left newspapers. Um, I was on the News of the World when it closed in 2011. And I moved from newspapers at that point into the betting industry and spent about five years there. And while I was there, set up my consultancy. And long story cut short, had a great time, met some great people, um, left that particular contract and relaunched as a copywriter because it was the obvious thing to do because all the work that I'd been doing in most recent times there was to do with words because so many people were saying, can you do this? Can you write that? And it was the, just the obvious step for me to take. But at the same time, there are, there are things I wish I'd known. And there's, it's, it's a sort of, a, a, I won't go on too long about this, but there's like t 10 top tips. And the first five are the five behaviors that you need. Um, I would suggest if you're going to go into business uh, one is you've got to be brave you've got to be resilient you've got to be agile you've got to be visionary and you've got to be energetic and that spells out B-R-A-V-E you know you've got to be brave because yeah. it is it is a challenge and like I said earlier I, I have unlimited respect for anybody who takes on that challenge and makes a success of it um, the next three out of the top 10 are three questions and three questions you have to answer with absolute forensic honesty. And you have to ask yourself, number one, do people want what you're selling? Uh, I, I, I'm a bit of a history buff and I was reading novels about the hundred years war when the longbow was the weapon of choice. Now, if you were making longbows in the middle of the 14th century, <laughs> you were the bomb.com and everyone was going to be coming to you. If you rocked up at an arms fair in 2020 with a, table full of longbows you're not going to see dollar one so therefore before you go into business have some conversations with people and say 
is this something people want? And I, I, I was, when I was setting up as a copywriter, I was convinced and I remain convinced that there is a great demand for copywriting and getting a message across as well as it can be. Um, the second question, this again, you've got to be honest, are you good at what you do? I, do you excel at it? Because if, again, using the example of a copywriter, if it takes you half an hour to write a sentence and there's three spelling mistakes in it, you're probably not going to be a copywriter. And the third question is, and this is probably the most important of a lot, do you love what you do? Because even if you do love it, there are going to be days. I mean, there's times I'm sat there at quarter past 11 at night finishing off a piece of copy, and I know I've got to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go networking, and you think, this is, this is a heck of a long day, and that's something I love. Now, imagine if it was something I didn't love doing. That would be unbearable. So it's important to get the answers to those three questions. And the other two things I would suggest, the last two of the top 10 tips, um, number one, make sure you have your website up and running and optimized because I didn't. I started as a copywriter without a website and it took me a long time to get it in the shape and optimized as I wanted and needed it to. And the final one is have your T's and C's in place. So when you start work with a new client, send them, a, send them your terms of, of business, send them a written costing because I would say over the last three years, 95% of the people I've dealt with have been brilliant and they've been honorable and they've been great to deal with. But actually more like 97, 98%, but occasionally you come across someone who doesn't pay up. And if you've got something in place which they've agreed to and you can just say, right, cough up, you, you signed this or you agreed to this, then you have some legal recourse and people tend to pay up at that point. Um, and I, I can't believe I went into business without that. So those, those are the sorts of the, the general pieces of advice. And I do get asked occasionally you know, about what it takes to go into business. So those, that, those are the top 10 tips. I'd say they're excellent. I, I agree with 100% of them. The, and I, one I especially agree with is energy. Yes. You've got to be passionate about what you do, yes. and you said you said about um, don't you know if you have a if you took you took you half an hour to write one sentence, you've got to see smoke stacks in. You're not going to be a copywriter, and that's me. You know, I I can't spell at all. I'm awful at spelling, and that's probably a story yeah, for another right. time. But it's well, because there's a million things I can't do, and um, I'm happy enough to admit that. But but I can spell. <laughs> And, and just to say with that, that thing about energy, being energetic, we, we kind of take it for granted that, of course, you're going to work hard at your business. But when you get to the stage when you have, I mean, there was one year I, I didn't take any time off while I was building the business up. Or we, we didn't, I didn't have a holiday. You know, and, and you, or if the client comes along and says, I need this by Monday and it's Friday night and it's a client you want to, to do well for, well, that's your weekend gone. And you do it because because you want your business to be successful you want to be well regarded you want to be retained and you want people to come back to you and tell all their friends wow i got great service from them so you do it but it does take and you can't downplay or you know deny it it does take energy it does take you've, you're going to have to be committed and and work hard to be a success at it there's no two ways about it yeah i think one of the themes i can pick up in in what you just said there is sacrifice you've got to be willing to sacrifice that holiday that downtime that people take for granted yeah i mean when i was when i was trying to break into uh, national newspapers and i was working full-time on a local newspaper in west london and i would go and spend my evening i'd, I'd spend a whole day at work on the local paper and i was on the subs desk there and it was it was a very hard working subs desk and i'd go up to the station and get the train into town and go to work on the, the daily express for a shift on the sports desk and that would be friday nights and it would be sundays as well and you didn't do it thinking well this is a bit of an imposition you thought well that's that's the step i've got to take to get to where i want to go so at the time you kind of don't think about it it's only you look back afterwards and think that was mad you know working seven days a week sometimes because you've got a clear goal in mind, you, you kind of make that sacrifice almost without it feeling like a sacrifice. Mm. You're right. Absolutely right. I think as business owners as well, you know, you, you, whatever people say, you are working on your vision. 
the work if it's for freedom if it's for your family if it's for money if it's for, it doesn't matter you're working on it and uh, the, the, the personality types which do really really well in this are those which are willing to put the long-term success over the short-term pain which you're going to experience so you know when someone works seven days a week um every week for, for six months and they go how do you do it they go do what like, what, what am i doing like work every day it's just well it's not work i, I enjoy doing this and you know when it's going well, it's going really well. that is definitely key like i said that goes back to one of the things i said in that that list of 10 if you're doing if you're working on something that you love or and the, or the process that, that you're working on is something that you love then you, you don't notice it as much and that's that's definitely the case for me because i do i do love writing so I, it doesn't I, when, like i said when i'm sat there at quarter past 11 at night i think i've got two more pages to write and i'm not going to finish till after midnight i don't sit there weeping because but i think well that's you know, that's that's the job that's that's what I've, I've signed up for and also just to pick on something you said if you work um seven days a week for six months it's not because you want to work seven days a week for the next six months and the rest of your life it's because you are working towards as you say a vision a place where i mean for me i'd, I'd love to say it would be great to get the, the work-life balance right and to be able to walk away from the business for you know all weekend or weeks at a time um and i'm not there yet um but if i've got the right clients on board the right set of clients which i'm working towards then that is a reasonable vision to say i'm going to get to that point and say right this is without being complacent without thinking i've got this nail i've got this sussed but thinking this is the situation i want to go in and that's where we're going to stay a part of this you mentioned about um how you first started in journalism that you had a work experience and then somehow they um within a couple of hours of you asking someone left Yes. What what more is there to that? What happened? Tell tell me the story. Well, um, to go back further than that, I I'd always I'd always wanted to be a sports journalist, and I knew I'd have to start on a local paper because that's the most conventional route in to to, to join a local paper. <coughs> Excuse me. I I went on a postgraduate course to get an NCTG. That, NCTJ, that's National Council for the Trading of Journalists, uh, certificate in journalism, just to sort of show that that you know your way around and you're serious about it and also you've got your shorthand. Um, and one of the things they said was, you must go and get some work experience. So I went and knocked on the, the door of my local paper before I went on the course and said, could I come, and, come in for a week? And they said, um, well, who are you? I said, well, you know, those uh, match reports that someone's been sending you from up north and sometimes you print them and sometimes you don't, because uh, every time Chelsea or Fulham or Brentford came up north, I would go and write a report and literally put it in the post and send it to the local paper. And like I say, sometimes they used it, sometimes they didn't. But on this particular day, the dividend paid off because they said, oh, that's you. Yeah, come in and have a week's work experience. And be because I did that and it went well, when I went back to them the following summer, and said, can I have some more work experience? They said, yes. And so all the all the, the, the sort of silly trips I did when I was a student up in the north, going to various places, like I say, and getting, and literally going back to my digs and writing a match report on an old typewriter and posting it off, um, it paid off because it got me through the door. It was, you know, we talked about sacrifice. It didn't feel like sacrifice at the time. It was what I wanted to be doing. Um, but it got me through the door and I was there when the opportunity arose and I became a, a, a junior reporter on a local paper covering um, the borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which as anyone who knows it will tell you, is, is a fantastic borough to be to have as your first patch because all human life is there from the, the north of the borough in North Kensington to the very posh bit of the south in Chelsea. But it, was, it was a great place to cut your teeth and, and to learn and it's... You know, you're, you're always learning in every situation you're in, but especially if it's a, a situation you've wanted to be in forever, you are, you're aware, you're like a, a human hu a hoover, a sponge, just soaking up all this knowledge and just wisdom of how to do things in your chosen profession. And it all kind of went from there. Wow. And when did you join, is it, when did you join your first big sort of newspaper? 
Uh, 1990, I, I, I got a, I'd been shifting at the Daily Express um, because I'd, I'd met various people, various Daily Express reporters while I was going covering matches for the local paper. And um, I started doing subbing shifts there and a job came up in late 1990 and I got it. And I was there for the next eight years as a, as a down table sub, as a middle bench revised sub, um, did a bit of writing on various sports and uh, I, I honest, honest to God, I was 26 years old when I got the break and you should have seen me for about 18 months my feet didn't touch the ground because I'd got to where I wanted to go and I, where I thought I really did think I was going to be there for the rest of my life. What changed? What changed? Because I mean, yeah. <laughs> not the nineteenth month when uh, you started to touch the ground again. What? <laughs> oh, well, oh, sorry. In terms of that, no, you just you adjust to your new circumstances. It becomes like this is this is real life. This is actually happening, mm-hmm. and just went from there. And in terms of what changed at the other end after twenty one years, like I say, I, I I spent eight years on the Express. I went over to the Mirror. Spent ten years as deputy sports editor on the Sunday Mirror and then moved on to the news of the world as digital head of sport. This is about the time, it, it felt the right time to go digital because papers are starting to embrace it. And also, you know, I, I'm aware we're going right off topic here, but um, I do believe that you have to have some kind of subscription model in place to um, monetize your content because the, the, the problem that media companies have faced in the last 25 years is that everyone expects everything on the internet to be free and good journalism costs. You know, you have to invest in your people, in your in your systems, in your structures. You you can't skimp on journalism, um, and with no money coming in, if you're giving it all away for free online, that is self-evidently a challenge. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to go to the news of the world was because they had a paywall. I remember saying to people at the time, "It's going to take 15 years." to affect the sea change in people's attitudes to get them to realize a that content is available online um, but b that you can pay for it and it's worth paying for it because the question shouldn't be for readers and potential subscribers can i afford to take out a subscription it's can i afford not to and you make your content as good as you possibly can um, to persuade people to to invest in you and the paper I would always point at now, here we are in 2020, that I believe has got it right, is The Times, because The Times has had a subscription model for a, a long time now, and the numbers, the hundreds of thousands of people who have signed up as subscribers to The Times, tell you that, that yeah, eventually people will get it, that it's worth making that deal and paying for something, because in return you get quality, you get quality journalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should declare an interest. I did work for the Times Online Sports Desk for a while, a few years ago. So they are a former employer of mine. Ah, I see. Obviously, that's not the reason why you mentioned them. You mentioned them because they're no, excellent. I genuinely, genuinely do think they've got the model right. Yeah. I know that um, a very famous um, publication, BuzzFeed, um, you know, for the millennial, they were all free, but they were, got into this rabbit hole of, it ha- always had to be sensational clickbait content. And it was always, you know, creating a scene, always um, quite, I wouldn't say aggressive, but quite confrontational in the way they were doing things. And that meant that their only source of income was ad- advertisement and the clicking. So it had to be sensational every single time, which meant that the journalism was just awful. It was terrible. Yeah, I could... I could. I can give you five reasons why that didn't work. You won't believe number four. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact it became a cliche, as you say, it, it's short-termist because, of, because eventually people will suss out that it is just clickbait, that it's not, it's not the real thing. And in, in the end, uh, we, we could talk all day about how important good journalism is. But one of the most important elements of it is that, that people trust it. And if you've clicked on for the tenth time and seen that it's just you know a whole string of clickbait and there's actually no real value, will you stop clicking? Yeah. So that it's a short-term strategy with no long-term benefit. Yeah, and I think I think it's probably this that culture is what started the old you know fake news because you were getting absolute rubbish being pushed out that half of it wasn't even true. 
at most half of it wasn't even true, you know, at, at least none of it was true. And what was happening is that you, you just, the, the faith in the um, media started to wane an awful lot. I think that Britain is, uh, British people have the least amount of faith in their media than any other European country. It's that yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah, which is a shame because, and I'm not just saying it because I worked in it, but I still, I still do believe that there is an immense amount of really good quality journalism going on in the British media. Immense amount of it. And I take your point about, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of clickbait sites and the rush to the bottom. But, you know, fake, fake news, is, is it almost got taken over by, by the politicians and the, the shady forces behind them thinking, as you say, this is a way of getting people's attention um i i don't want to sound too defensive but i really do think that there are certain titles out there which, which are still doing great stuff who you know i've always said a news a newspaper we, we you may think that when you're working on a paper you're there to educate and entertain people but most newspapers are there to reinforce their readers prejudices and that's how they will spin or cover a particular story because they know their audience wants to see a story a particular way, um, which can, in times of great political upheaval and hardship, and in some cases extremism, that can be a, a negative force with, without any doubt at all. But at heart, at root, I do still think there is great, great journalism done. And I'm not just, I, I, obviously my perspective is from the sports side, I think there are still some wonderful writers, I think there are still some wonderful publications who do really, really good work as as journalists in this country. And it always pains me when, as you say, you hear that, uh, that newspapers in this country are, tr are trusted less than in other countries. And by the way, I don't think that's a new thing. When you think of the tabloid circulation wars of the late 80s and some of the... Um, some of the extremes of behaviour and tactics that that led to, I think there's, I can't think of a time when, when the universe, when so the British press was universally trusted. Mm. There's always that, that element of they're just doing it to sell papers. Yeah. What, you know, if we're giving recommendations, what would you recommend to be a, a good one or two papers to subscribe to and to read? Honestly, the Times. I, I, it's the one paper I buy when I go out. If I'm going on a train journey, I'll buy the Times. It's the one paper I will, I will click on to. I, well, I've worked with some of the writers and I know them and I like them, but I like the, the, the sheer quality of the writing. You've got guys like you know, Mike Atherton, Matt Dickinson, Henry Winter. You know, there, there's authority. There is beautiful writing. It was, it was a pleasure to work with these guys. And I, I do still think they, they, get, they get it right. And, you know, I, I may be biased because I work there, but um, no, I, I really do like their stuff. Fab, fab. And so you had all this time in, in journalism and you mentioned that you made the transition when you were in an agency. It was an agency, sorry. A, um, what was the word you used? Oh, the betting industry. Yeah, so betting industry. What was it that made you sort of make the leap and start your own business? You know, was it financial freedom or... You know? In, in some ways it was circumstantial, but in other ways it was it was the obvious next step. Um, I'd I'd spent some time with with Labrooks, which was which was very interesting, a great learning experience. My first time out of newspapers. Um, I then went on to a B two B firm within the betting industry who provide products and services to the global industry, and that was I was there for for quite some time. But I was there as a consultant. And after about a year, one of my colleagues who's also a consultant said, look, set up your business, set up a consultancy, because then you can you know, get other clients on board. And it's just, it's just a more efficient way of operating. So that's what I did. And then when, when that contract finally came to an end, I thought, well, the obvious thing for me to do is words. Because in and amongst all the projects I was doing while I was in this particular company, people would be saying, oh, can you help me write this email for me? Or can you write my LinkedIn profile for me? Or we need to do a, <clears throat> a strategy for the next 10 years of how we work with horse racing. Can you write it for us? And so always it seemed that my, that my writing skills are what were bringing value to the time I was spending there and to the people I was working with. So it was a, in some ways, 
a very obvious next step to to keep working as a consultant but is but to take this new direction of branding myself and relaunching myself as a copywriter and pretty pretty soon started picking up clients it it took a long time and one thing i'd always say to people starting business don't expect it to be an instant success because as you and i were both agreeing earlier <coughs> you need to to build up your brand your presence your network and the, the clients will come along if you if you do a good job if you produce something that, that delivers results for them people will come um, and it took like it probably took the best part of two years before I got the business to where I want it to be but then the last year has been absolutely sensational and despite everything that's happened with COVID the underlying strength and health of the business is unchanged and I know I'm giving a good service to people I, I've now got a, a fantastic network of people who get that and that's going to carry on so that's what made you start the business. What kept you inside the business? Because if, it must have, if it's took you two years, there must have been highs and there's yep. got to have been lows. So what's, what's kept you steadfast, determined to stay in it? Probably the, sen the sense of um, validation on the good days and knowing this is what I should be doing. That I should be working in words because it's, it's what I'm good at. Um, and... I guess it's, it's, it's as simple as that. The, the one thing I'm never going to get used to, Ash, is the, is the extremes of emotion. When you have a bad day, like I say, the days when the phone doesn't ring, the day when someone tells you they don't like your work, the day when someone says, I'm going to go and use a different copywriter. You know, those, you, you really are low. You know, you could, as I say, you could parachute out of a, a snake's belly. You're that low. But the good days when the phone doesn't stop ringing, when everyone's telling you how great your stuff is, it, it's matchless. The feeling, of, the feeling of euphoria, but also a sense of validation. The sense that, yes, I know I'm doing the right thing. I know this is right for me. And some, part of it's instinct, part of it is learned, part of it you get from the response of clients. But no, at no point, despite what I said earlier about the long dark nights of the soul, at no point did I think, no, I'm going to just chuck this in and change completely there's also the fact I'm, I'm a bit i'm a bit probably too long in the tooth to start training and starting things right down at the bottom i know someone very early after i left um my, I, I was between jobs in the betting industry and someone said oh you know you could work in marketing i said of course i could work in marketing said, the, the, the skills are very obviously transferable and and comparable and they said oh well, you might need to get a, a qualification as a digital marketer and i thought well that's great i go on a course and i come out and i get an entry-level job that's that's just not feasible so yes i work in marketing and sometimes i, th I think that, that people who are looking for and i'm talking more in a sort of permanent job sense here people will focus on what you've done not on what the skills that you have accrued make you able to do there's a sense that you have to have done something before to be able to do it again. Um, but that's, that's, that's kind of a perception thing. You know, I've never really thought of it like that. I've never really put you so you're spot on that, you know, when you go for a more permanent job, a more, um, we'll say a more standard job, you know, we're not working for yourself. They always do look at what you've done as a means of trying to replicate to give themselves confidence that they can do it again for you. But in actuality, I think that 70% of your work in a, in a normal job is, is your team, the team that you have around you that facilitates that. And if you don't have a very good team or, or support network, then the chances of you doing the same thing again is, is exceptionally low. And it's, it's also, it's not so much the job you're doing, but the, the, the skills that you need to be able to do that particular job. And I, I don't want this to, to turn into a rant against uh, recruiters because I've, re I've met some very, very good individual recruiters. But far, far too often, it's a box ticking CV exercise and it's what you have done rather than the focus being on the skills that you've got that made you appropriate for the things you've done in the past. Um, I, I, as a, for instance, a, a good pal of mine who works, still works for a national paper and we've had a couple of coffees in Kingston in the last couple of years and he's thinking of you know, moving on and trying something else. And I said to him that one, one thing that you don't realise, that I didn't realise when I was in newspapers, is how incredibly transferable 
your skills are when you're a journalist, not just in terms of the words, but in terms of project management. When you're, when you're laying out an edition, for instance, and deciding what the running order of the pages is on the flat plan, that's project management and working under pressure and working at speed against the deadline. Those, those things make you valuable in context way, way beyond newspapers. And I think, I, I know I was the same when I came out of papers, I was trying to think, what, what can I do? All I've ever done is newspapers. But actually the things I did while I was in those, those contexts were far broader, far more transferable than I ever realized. So we're coming pretty much close to the end now. And it's been fab. Thank you. you know, all good things, you know, all that. Um, you mentioned earlier about the top 10 things that you need to start a business. And we both said that um, it's energy, it's passion, it's, it's sacrifice. It's, that's, that's what you need. Do you have anything that you'd want to say to people who are just starting and maybe to people that are in the, in the depths right now of um, the issues that they're having with the business? Is there anything that, you know, the insight? Um, I'd go back to those three questions. The three questions you have to ask yourself. You know, does the market want what I've got? Which, which may not be an obvious answer in the current circumstances, because maybe right now the market is saying, come back to me when things start moving. But if you believe and you know that the market will want what you've got, and if you can say that you are good at what you do and most importantly if you can say you enjoy what you do then it's worth sticking at it definitely is worth sticking at and being persistent and being a little bit brave and getting you know the, getting your big pants on and saying well this we are where we are in these current circumstances but this too shall pass and if somehow you can get through it and survive it you know i i'm i'm confident that when things do start moving and people have got money to spend on their marketing budgets, I'm going to, they're going to be knocking my door down because people get the importance of communicating their message. So for me, I, I'm as confident as ever in my business and my ability to run it and make a success of it. But that's because I ask myself those three questions and say, yes, yeah, I, I, I'm sure of those three things. And if you're in the same boat, then it, it, it I don't want to sort of sound like I'm sermonizing or, you know, being patronizing or, or just sort of cliched, but, but yeah, this too shall pass and we, we, we will get through it and there will be business to be done. And if you're good at it and if you like it, then go and do it. Fab. Thank you for today, Martin. You've been wonderful. And I think that you could probably going to impact a lot of people. I think a, a whole lot of people are going to need to hear what you've said today. So yeah, thank you for your time. It's been wonderful. Ash, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.